me. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to worship for March 22nd. As you know, we're trying our best to get the message out there each week. And uh, we're putting it on uh, the YouTube channel, we're putting it on Facebook, we're putting it on the website. Also, if for some reason you don't have any of those things, then uh, we can get you a written transcript. We'll probably send some of those out anyway, uh, because we want to make sure that we, uh, uh, we stay in the Word. Uh, we take the, uh, the uh, Sunday school, or uh, not Sunday school, but the adult Bible school. Uh, on uh, Tuesday, and uh, we're also uh, taping it again this coming Tuesday, so we'll try to keep that going. Uh, also, if you have any prayer concerns and requests, please call the office, and if you can't get the office, they will give you my cell phone number so you can call me, and we got to make sure that we stay in touch. Uh, I do have some announcements. Um, according to what's happening out there in the world, as far as the restrictions and so forth that we're under, they're um, announcing that there will be no worship through March 29th, and so the blended service that we were going to have on the 29th will not be happening. Uh, after that, we have decided that we will be making the decision uh, pretty much on a weekly basis because this whole situation seems to be changing. Uh, I can tell you one thing, though, the philosophy is, and what I've seen in other churches and what we've heard from uh, our bishop and so forth, is odds are, if the numbers keep going up on a weekly basis, we are not going to be uh, turned loose in order to have uh, gatherings and worship. And so, if you see on the television uh, each night and so forth, uh, the, the numbers of of uh, people who have been contaminated and deaths and so forth, if they continue to go up, then that means odds are we will not be able to worship together, but we can certainly do it electronically. Even if we're in a lockdown situation where we're all at home, uh, I will still have the ability to uh, record messages and so forth and get that out to you by the same methods. Um, and so we will continue to post those things uh, at those places. Uh, also another announcement, the new member classes that we were having, we had one left to do and then we we're gonna bring the new members in on the 29th. Uh, all of that has, um, all of those will continue once we are back to normal scheduling. And of course, as I said, that's not going to be for a while. Uh, also, for all of the, the members and the Friends of Trinity, if you are in need of any necessities, uh, please feel free to contact the church and uh, we will try to arrange for help. And again, you, there's many people who have offered to step in and help wherever we could. And so if you can, uh, give me a call on my cell phone. You all have that number. It's 717-512-0015. Uh, in regard to your tithing, we've come up with two ways where you can continue your tithing because, of course, the needs of the church are continuing. Uh, first would be to mail. Just simply put your uh, check uh, in the envelope and put it in the mail and the steward will come in and count it and make sure it gets to the bank and where it needs to be. But also there's the uh, opportunity for electronic giving. Uh, those uh, instructions are on, uh, I believe, on the website, so we can make sure that you still have the ability to do that, sign up for electronic giving, because again, we really have no idea how long this is going to go on, uh, and so we would appreciate you, of course, uh, keeping up your tithe to God's church. Um, also, because of the deadline for ordering, we are not going to be ordering Easter flowers, from what we understand, odds are they can't get those to us anyway. So for those of you who have already given us checks, uh, we will make sure that your checks are returned. And those of you who gave cash, we will make sure that your cash is refunded. And so if you have any questions about that, call Nancy at the office and uh, we will make sure that we get that handled. Um, in addition, Overall, we're encouraging everyone to stay in touch with one another. You all have uh, cell phones or regular telephones. You, a lot of you have computers. You're on Facebook. 
I think that this is an excellent time for us to not only stay in touch with one another, but to stay in touch with the world, to uh, let them know that through the power of Christ, uh, we will get through this. You can't ever forget the idea that God's providence is evident. He has a plan for all of us. We will get through this. We will succeed. And so if you want to drop somebody a card or a letter or just pick up the phone, I think that that is vitally important that we continue to do this. Uh, this morning for worship, we're in Ephesians. I know we said we were going to be in Romans, but in order to understand some of the things that Paul says in Romans, we needed to visit uh, his letter to the Ephesians, which, by the way, he wrote while he was in Rome. So, for me, it's pretty much the same thing. But first, uh, I want to give you some strength from the word of the Lord. Uh, our call to worship for the day would be Psalm 23. And I know all of you know this, but uh, I need you to focus on these words and understand the provision that God has for his sheep. This is David saying, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters and restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. And thou anointest my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's come to him in prayer. Father, indeed, in these times we look to you because you are our shepherd. And as your sheep, Lord, sometimes we can get ourselves in a lot of trouble and we can be confused as far as what to do. And in the ways of the world, we forget the power and the strength that emanates from you. Father, forgive us for that. Forgive us for not reaching out when we know we should. Forgive us for not being strong when we know we have your strength always. Regardless of what's happening in the world, Lord, you are with us. You promised that and you delivered on that promise. And so as we go through our days dealing with these things from one minute to the next, can be kind of overwhelming, Lord, because we don't know exactly what to do, and we're not used to restrictions in that regard. But here we find ourselves in a situation where we must all pull together. We must love one another as you have loved us. We must reach out to one another and give the comfort that you have given to us. There's many people out there right now, Lord, that need prayers. And so let us all make sure that indeed that we lift this up to you on a daily basis. Father, they tell us on television that we're supposed to constantly be washing our hands. And while we wash our hands, they have suggested that we sing happy birthday. Well, Lord, right now sometimes we don't feel so happy. So teach us to modify that instruction, Lord, that, that each time we wash our hands, we might take a moment and pray. Lift up prayers to you, Lord. Lift up prayers for our neighbors, for our friends, for people that we don't even know. People in many countries are suffering from this same malady, Lord. Let us indeed take those times, those moments to be in prayer. We're told in Scripture that we're to pray daily, without ceasing. And so let's turn that into an opportunity to do exactly that, washing our hands as we lift our prayers to you. Gather us together as you can do to all of your sheep, Father. Guide us and protect us in your love always. In Jesus' name, amen. And so as I said, our message for today is Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 14. And, and if you want some background, uh, 
go back to chapter 4, for instance, because Paul talks about the need for unity, for instance. He talks about living as children of the light. And that's what this section today is about. How do we do that? We talk about being children of the light, but do we really follow through on achieving that? So Ephesians chapter 5 verses 8 through 14 says, For you were once darkness, <clears throat> but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Having nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For it is light that makes everything visible. And that is why it is said, Wake up, O sleeper. Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. We are to be strengthened always by the word of the Lord, and that's why we are to be in the word, because we're called to live our lives as children of this light. <clears throat> God finds many ways to shine his light upon us, first of all, in our spirit, through the Holy Spirit, and through his word, and, and through prayer, and through interaction with one another by whatever means. The light that he planted inside of us is supposed to produce fruit that will please him. And so there's no limitation on that. This national emergency is an opportunity for us to be light, to produce fruit, to call people and say, hey, I'd like to pray with you. I'd like to pray for you. You are in our thoughts and in our prayers. Do you hold everything that you do up to a light to make sure that it's pleasing to Him? Or do you just give of yourself what is pleasing and convenient to you? I think a lot of times in the world, that's how we make our decisions. We get up in the morning and say, I'm going to do what I have to do to get through my day. These times can be very much like that, where we look and say, oh, I can't wait till I get home and know that I'm safe. But in the midst of this, is Christ saying, I am calling you into the light. From the Old Testament time until the birth of Christ, it was a time of darkness and no communication from God. We've talked about this for 400 years. The Israelites called upon God they wandered around looking for him and they found nothing. Because of their many failings and indiscretions, he wasn't to be found. Some continued to follow in faith and some drifted away and began worshiping other gods. And I fear sometimes that's what we have done. I don't know if you're old enough to remember this. I certainly am. Do you remember the test pattern? In the early age of television, at the end of the day, whether you liked it or not, at 11 p.m., the national anthem was played and an announcement came on that their programming day had ended. And from then on until sometime the next morning, the screen went blank. But the last thing you saw was something they called the test pattern. And that was your signal to, hey, the day's over, go to bed. Even if you wanted to see another show, you couldn't. <laughs> Imagine that happening nowadays with hundreds of around-the-clock channels. Our TVs communicate a never-ending supply of things to us. And that is exactly the way Scripture tells us to think of Christ Jesus in our lives. By virtue of the Holy Spirit, there's never the showing of a test pattern. 
There's never the end of his programming day. In the middle of the night, if you are in agony and you, you wake up and you drop to your knees in prayer saying, Lord, help me. He hears. He is there. Constant communication with the Father is a reality. It is said that Jesus is the light of the world, and it's this truth that we need to keep in mind as we study Ephesians. Paul is reminding them. He teaches us to walk in the light and develops this outline here. Verses 8 to 10, he talks about walking in light by exhibiting light. Verses 11 to 14a, he says we walk in light by exposing darkness. And then third, on verse 14b, he says we walk in light by exhorting to unbelievers. In other words, showing unbelievers where our light comes from. These times are a great time for that. There's a lot of tension, there's a lot of unrest, there's a lot of well, indecisiveness. What do we do next? Where do we go? What's going to happen? This is an excellent time for us to show others the power of God, that regardless of where we are, either locked in our homes or allowed to come out for a bit, our light, our power comes from God. Dr. Donald Barnhouse, American theologian and a master of illustration, explains it this way. When Christ was in the world, he was like the shining sun. When the sun sets, the moon comes up. The moon is a picture of believers, the church. The church shines, but not with its own light. It reflects light, reflects the light of God. At times the church has been a full moon dazzling the world with almost daily light. Those were times of great enlightenment, enlightenment, for example, in the days of Paul and Luther and Wesley. But at other times the church has only been a thumbnail moon, a little sliver. And in those days very little light shone on the earth. But whether the church is a full or a thumbnail moon, whether waxing or waning, it must always reflect the light of Christ. Because whatever light we have does not originate with us. So Paul suggests that we are to find ways to become light. Verse 8a again, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. That's really staggering when you think about it because in times like this you're not feeling so light. You've got your own concerns, you've got your own worries and when you don't know what's going to happen the next day it can be hard to be bright and shining to others. But if you remember right, Peter said we're supposed to always be ready to give people the hope that we have. And that hope that we have is our inner light. Go to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. Jesus said this to his followers, you are the light of the world. And he meant that. You are the light, you are meant to be the light, you are to keep the light shining. Paul described the characteristics of this light in verse 9. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. Think about that for a minute. What do you make sure that you show to others? All that is good and right and true. Corey Tenbu tells how during hard times in the watchmaking business when the family was in extreme financial need, she observed her father, who was a watchmaker, 
And a wealthy customer, the wealthy man, had decided to purchase a costly timepiece with cash, which would have met all of the family's needs. But as her father was handling the cash, the customer related that he was buying a new watch because Mr. Ten Boom's young competitor could not fix his old watch. Corey's father asked to see it. He opened it. He made a slight adjustment and handed it back saying, there, that was a very little problem. It will be fine now. Sir, I trust the young watchmaker. Someday he will be just as good as his father. And so if you ever have a problem with one of his watches, come to me. I'll help you out. And now I shall give you back your money and you can return the watch. Corey watched horrified as she saw the exchange and then observed her father open the door for the man and bow deeply in his old-fashioned way. And she flew at her father in reproof, only to be herself corrected by her father. Through his steel-rimmed glasses and his gentle question, he said, Corey, what do you think that young man, that young watchmaker, would have said when he heard that one of his good customers had gone to Mr. Tenpu. Do you think that the name of the Lord would be honored? As for the money, trust the Lord, Corey. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and he will take care of us. What a great example of what it means to be liked. They were a poor family and they were in dire straits and they could have very easily sold that watch to the man. But the man didn't need the watch. He needed the, the light of someone who had Christ in order to show him that there was another way. In other words, as Christians exhibit what is good and right and true, they will, as John MacArthur says, give verification or evidence that they are who they claim to be, children of God and the light of the world. And so we've got to think of that and put that first and foremost on the things that we do, how we make our decisions in these times. I said in my newsletter article, these are the times that test men's souls, and indeed, these are the times that test the light of each and every Christian. We walk in light by exposing darkness. Paul said to believers in verse 11, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Wow, this is difficult. But Paul wrote in verse 3, sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you. In addition, this view is strengthened by what he says in verse 12. It's shameful. It's shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. You see, what unbelievers do is darkness. Christians must not do what they formerly did, as you know. Repenting is to turn 180 degrees from the things that you did and now go in a different direction. Always going toward God. Remember the name Amy Carmichael. She was born in Ireland in 1867 and became a missionary of the Church of England. And she went to India and opened an orphanage and founded a mission. She served in India for 55 years without a furlough and wrote many books about her missionary work there. If you ever get a chance, read one of them. However, what is less known about her is the difficulty she had in raising support for her missionary work. She wanted to go to India to expose temple prostitution of children in India. But because of the Victorian sensibilities of the time, it was impolite for her to even mention that in public. Thankfully, she was committed to exposing the unfruitful works of those in the darkness so strongly that she gave up any convention or any propriety and she spoke realistically about the need. And indeed, 
her ministry had great success. And that's what Christians are still called to do today. It hasn't changed. We walk in light by exposing darkness, and sometimes we do that simply by our presence. People are to know when they see us, or shortly after engaging in conversation with us, they are to know that we're people of the light. So that means we need to speak up. Oh, and that's difficult, because there is so much evil in the world today. Sometimes we don't know when to speak up. Sometimes we think that it's a very dangerous situation to say a word. And so we tend to go the other way. We tend to just kind of keep it quiet. We go to Psalm 119, verse 105. Kind of says, if not me, then who? The psalmist says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. A light to our path. But when anything exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. And that's what Paul says in verses 13 and 14. So it ties in to the ongoing, never-ceasing responsibility to find a way to expose darkness by being light. And finally, we're to walk in light by exhorting unbelievers. Oh, this can be difficult. I remember in seminary reading a book that was called, I Hate Witnessing. And that's true. So many people say, first of all, people don't, other people don't want to hear it. So I'm going to just love God and keep it to myself. But the reality is what Paul says. Awake, O oh sleeper and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. What he's saying is, is that if you are in Christ, if you have accepted him as your Lord and Savior, then if you don't go forth as a beacon,